Hello and welcome to our broadcast, Exploring Implicit Bias in the History Social Science Classroom. We are here now with Module 3, Exploring the Ethnic Transformations of California. If you had a chance to watch Module 1, you learned about the inquiry arc and using inquiry-driven instruction to frame ethnic studies. And in Module 2 with Sandra Line, we talked about developing mindsets, skill sets to move forward. And we're very excited now with Module 3 here. Right now, we are in part two of module three. Part one, if you got to see it, was kind of laying the overview, the framework on ethnic California, who we are as a state, how we're changing with demographics and what to look for. This part two is gonna focus on California past transformative resistance. This is a term from the ethnic studies model curriculum. And then in part three, the other term will focus on critical hope and then part four on radical healing. I'm thrilled to once again welcome my good friend and colleague, Barbara Vallejo Doton, who's the project director for the California Global Education Project. Fabulous teacher leader, lots of great experience as a teacher in Long Beach and LA Unified Barb. Thanks for all your prep and for bringing part two to us today. Thank you. So review the three terms for us again, because they're powerful. Right, so when we talk about transformative resistance, we're really thinking about how communities of color have grappled with identity and positionality to address complex issues and processes to disrupt inequalities. When we think about critical hope, we're looking at the features of a just society and how communities of color have articulated what that justice looks like. And when we look at radical healing, we're envisioning new opportunities for healing while equipping students with change-making tools of empowerment. I love the empowerment. So part two, we're gonna focus on transformative resistance, right? Right. right. Okay. Uh, and just to kind of frame it around the definition and how it addresses identity and positionality, this is also from the model curriculum. Uh, and the part of the model curriculum that I like to highlight is this second part of this paragraph. Teachers, especially those with limited ethnic studies knowledge, should engage in activities that allow them to unpack their own identities, mm. privilege, marginalization, lived experiences, and ideas around culture and social justice while they are also learning about the experience of others. So I know in, in the second module, Sandy talked a lot about this test about the Harvard Implicit Association test. Again, I just want to reiterate, when we're doing this work and we're talking about narratives that have never been told or are, are limited, mm -hmm. we really need to go deep inside and think about how am I a part of that? Mm. How, what are the implicit biases that I might have around specific groups or genders or gender assignations or, or economic status? And so it's really important that we do this work before delving into the ethnic studies work. Yes, we have to know who we are, our own identity, take the time to do that, because based on our lived experience, information that comes at us, it creates bias, implicit and explicit bias for all of us. We can't overemphasize that enough. Right. Figure out your own identity, ask students to look at theirs, then we're ready to move forward. So the Harvard test is a wonderful tool. As you mentioned, we mentioned it in module two, and we hope it's something that teachers, all educate, and actually anyone, give it to family members. That'll be interesting <laughs> to do too. There's an interesting just to identify what your own, you don't have to report your scores. <laughs> it's just very reflective. You might agree or not agree, but it's, it's just a great tool, and I know it's being used a lot. So yeah. we can't, yeah. And you can find the tool, of course, on the site where you found the broadcast. Good place to start. Yes. Okay, so transformative resistance and this whole idea uh, of identity and positionality really calls us to thinking about how do we disrupt the single narrative? So students need to see themselves represented as empowered individuals, as members of a group and identity and the lived experience of others is what teachers have to recognize, that they have all these different groups with different heritages and, and cultural knowledge that is, are there to really add to the learning experience, but how do we how do we get away from the single narrative? Right, and in the textbooks they have, mm -hmm. they're getting better, but sometimes you'll just see a single narrative, a single point of view. So we gotta have that critical eye for looking at it. I think the tool we shared in module one 
about how to look at a textbook and where to find those things yes, yes. was really powerful. So we kind of agreed it was it's a hard time to be a pub textbook publisher. <laughs> how do you include all that? So. Right. But so important, right? Yes. So when we look at this theme of identity in the model curriculum, they have laid out these specific themes with some really robust questions. And I just want to highlight a couple from the theme of identity. One question might be, how do our identities influence our choices and the mm. choices available to us? Mm -hmm. Another question might be, how is identity shaped and reshaped by our specific circumstances? So when thinking about this idea of identity and looking at the four foundational disciplines, in this particular part of the module, I'd like to highlight the Asian and Pacific Islander ethnic group and also the Latinx group. So when we talk about the growing Asian population in California, this is data from the census. As you can see on this chart, what is red is the growing Asian population. Mm. You know, what do you notice about that? Yes. Right? It is really not just isolated to one particular area or along the coast or just in the Inland Empire, for example. It is really crossing the whole state and you're of California. Seeing urban areas and rural areas. Right. Interesting. Right. So the positionality of those groups in those particular economic regions, right, or geographic regions, how does that change their identity or how does that impact their identity? And there's a lot of diversity too within the Asian American Exactly. Uh, and we'll talk about yeah, community. We'll get to that. We'll too. get to that. Something as a Latina, I'm you know, all Latinas are Mexican? No. 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 <laughs> but we'll, we'll get there. So one of the resources that I'd like to present to teachers is this wonderful video about the Hmong community in mm -hmm. the Central Valley, because I think it exemplifies some of these questions around identity and how we identify them and how they mm -hmm. identify themselves within the social, economic, and political landscape in which they find mm -hmm. themselves. So let's take a few minutes to watch this video, and we'll come back at the other end. Okay. Thank you, Barb. It's been 46 years since the Hmong people first began migrating to the U.S. from Laos and Thailand as refugees. During the Vietnam War, the CIA recruited Hmong men in Laos in an operation known as the Secret War. Communist forces retaliated against those who sided with the Americans. Thousands died and thousands fled to refugee camps and eventually made their way to America. Today, the Fresno area in Central California has the second largest Hmong population in the country, with about 33,000 people living in the region. The life in refugee is that uh, difficult. You cannot go outside, you cannot uh, pray around. Cha Fong Lee and his family escaped to a refugee camp in Thailand before settling in California. We don't know what to do. We don't know where we go. We just say, okay, go America, this is America. When we come here, that's it. We don't know the future. Since then, Lee owned several businesses, including Asia Supermarket in Fresno. The light in the future is still brighter and better for us. Paula Cha is a program manager at the Fresno Interdenominational Refugee Ministries. Her family came to the U.S. before there were organizations that provided resources to new immigrants and refugees. A lot of the churches in the United States um, spo sponsored the Hmong families from the refugee camps in Thailand. So that's how um, the Hmong families ended up in various different parts of the United States. The Hmong language didn't have a written form until the 1950s. Until then, women hand sewn their lived experiences on cloth. Our clothing um, and the images and patterns on our clothing um, represent the ancient writing system that we used to have. Images that we put onto our clothes um, are things that are found in nature like flowers and plants and um, landscapes, rivers, mountains. For Pachia Vang, the narratives woven into the fabric are beyond value. Learning about the power of our clothing and how it's helped us, you know, really hold on to our identity and our heritage and our history. I found a lot of empowerment through that. But for many Hmong people, it took looking within to find that sense of empowerment and pride. Lar Yang says there's a long history of Asian Americans changing their first name to better suit English speakers. It was born out of this, this um, disgrace of not understanding our own culture and not having anything to value. And so we almost had to, to detach from that history and to, to be able to absorb what it means to be an American, you know. 
He believes the greatest gift that you can give someone is the gift of their history. I just want all Hmong kids, through, through knowing, connecting to their history, to have a sense that they belong here in America and that through their, the sacrifices of their parents and their grandparents that they, they deserve the right to be here in America. These are just some of the kids who lived in refugee camps who later became doctors, attorneys, farmers, and educators. Blong Zhang served on the Fresno City Council. He's also the first person of Hmong descent to be elected to a city council in California. There are Americans that have not seen a, a Hmong person in that role. And so uh, I think there's also ex external pressure for me to, to let them know that we're just as intelligent, we're, we're just as articulate, we're, and we care about the community. That's a fascinating video. The Hmong story is, I would say, not known by many, particularly in urban areas, right? A, there's a, a large populations, mm -hmm. I think, in the Central Valley, as mm -hmm. was mentioned. And the history and the perspectives are just so profound and important for teachers, particularly if they have Hmong students in their classroom. We know the state is publishing model curriculum for Hmong, Vietnamese, and Cambodian experiences. So those will be very useful tools because like we said, there's diversity in that community. It's right. not just Japanese and Chinese, right? Right. Filipino, Pacific Islanders, Hawaiians, many, many great I, stories to be told. I thought it was fascinating that uh, in the video, it was mentioned that the Hmong didn't have a written language until mm -hmm. I think it was the mid 20th century, and that most of their stories, their no knowledge, was woven into their fabrics. Mm -hmm. So the attire that they wore told the story, mm -hmm. talked about their history. And so this is another opportunity for teachers to use those kinds of artifacts, yes. those kinds of, I quote, texts in the classroom. It's not just about reading words right. on a printed page, but how else can we acquire knowledge about cultures other than just a text, especially when they don't have a written language. Well, and it reminds us how historians are often frustrated looking for records and info. Indigenous people, right, right. native peoples, don't have a lot of written records. We know Africans brought here as slaves. There's not a lot of written records around births and deaths and livelihood in that, so. At least from their perspective. Yes, yeah. yes, and it's frustrating for historians but it's something, like you say, we need to bring out, capture, get those. That's why those oral histories are so powerful, too. Yes. So many of them get lost. Right. And also in the video, I think you could see the principal orator in the video was talking about his experience as a refugee. So coming in as an immigrant and coming in as a refugee, those are very different experiences. And what are the expectations that they have about themselves in this new land where they don't speak the language, they don't understand the political landscape, right. yet they were able through resilience, cultural collaboration and, and identity and, and really positioning themselves in that community, they were able to become entrepreneurs and yes. they own several supermarkets. Right? And we're seeing a lot of data now that many, if not most immigrants coming to the United States are motivated, become entrepreneurs, become contributors, help build the American economy, hard workers. They came here for a reason for a lot of them. We know many groups though did not come willingly. We can't, we, we can't over, you know, we have to recognize too, Africans did not come willingly. Mm -hmm. They were kidnapped and brought here and used as slaves. Right. It's a very different dynamic and institutionalization of discrimination, of course, that we all know has evolved and continues, unfortunately. Right, so here's an opportunity to pause and connect to what was in the video. What are some of the events that shaped the identities of the Hmong people that you saw in this video? Mm. What are similarities that you see with experiences of other groups or your own group? of how the Hmong experience coming to this country and thriving in this country, and how is identity shaped and reshaped by our mm. specific circumstances? So it'd be interesting to show that to students and ask them these same questions. I wonder right. if you could, could have good discussion around that. And it's also a great kind of segue into some of the sample lessons in the model curriculum. And so when I was putting together these different parts of this module, I wanted to make sure that there was a curriculum lesson that would support looking at some of these mm -hmm. ethnic groups in these different mm -hmm. ways, because I think it, it really helps to scaffold this for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, we, need, we need some specifics, right? It's wonderful to learn about the mom, but you know, how do I do this in a lesson? Yes. So I think the model curriculum does a wonderful job at that. Yes, there's a lot of great great lessons back there too. So. Right, and this one is specifically on the Hmong Americans. Hey, good. Community struggle and Works voice. Works well, right? good, good. Which 
delves deeper into identity and positionality in their community. And it's, when the Hmong model curriculum comes out, there'll be mm, exactly a ton of new, other lessons. Too There's that so can much be good used. work happening up and down the state. Yes, around really kind of beefing up. Yes. the lessons and the, and the resources for teachers. And it's important because we know a lot of the textbook publishers are really not moving into the ethnic studies world right. and providing a lot of curriculum. Right. A lot of things that we're seeing in schools are kind of homegrown. Right. But fortunately, there's been funding out there to create resources like this mm -hmm. and others from other entities around the state. So right. stay tuned, more is coming. <laughs> Get on Michelle's listserv. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next group, I, along with this theme of identity and positionality, um, I, I tagged the, the Latino, and I'm gonna mm -hmm. use that term because that's the term that I'm comfortable with. I know that we've been called Chicano, Latino, Hispanic, Latinx. Everyone I talk to has a different affinity for a different term. So I'm going to use the one I'm comfortable with. Okay. I chose it, nobody else, and it's Latina. Okay. So the Mexican American experience in this country has been long in history, right? And so I looked at this very provocative poster. We didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Ooh. And we talk about the indigenous background of mm -hmm. Mexicanos, right? And starting with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, when the Mexican-American War, when the land was no longer part of Mexico. Mm. I'm going to just phrase it that way. In this treaty, it was stated that the ranchos were to be kept in the possession of the Mexicanos who were there before. Of course, we know that didn't happen to the extent that maybe they would have. Otherwise, I would own Sonoma mm. <laughs> and Napa Valley being part of a, of a Vallejo. But so when we look at the experience, and you talked earlier about how the Hmong came here as immigrants, and you know it's a very different experience when you're an immigrant and a refugee. Mm -hmm. But these were neither immigrants nor refugees. Mm -hmm. It was a political decision that, ch mm -hmm. that changed the border yes. from here to here. And now you're under US governance. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to be an American? Who can be an American? Mm -hmm. Is it just the shift of the border? And what mm -hmm. happens when multiple narratives are layered upon each other. For example, with the Mexicano example, they were first part of Spain, then they were part of Mexico, then they were part of Texas, the Tejano Revolution, and now they're part of the United States. Where's their identity mm -hmm. in all those different layers and how, how did that shift or did it? Those are really good ways of exploring this, um, this narrative of transformative resistance because there's a lot of uh, questioning of identity and positionality that has to go on there just because political situations have changed. Can you have multiple identities? Oh, oh yes, 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 and. Mm -hmm. Multiple identities and experiences and responses mm -hmm. to different conditions mm -hmm. and situations. So in the model curriculum, Sample Lesson 12 does a really good job of talking about undocumented immigrants from Mexico and beyond, and they look at a story called mojada, which is a derogatory term for people who have crossed the border, wet back. Mm. right? A Medea in Los Angeles. And it takes the story of Medea and applies it to that experience of immigrants who have crossed the border since the border has been there, or really no border, just crossed the river, and really walks students to do a critical think of looking at multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are the issues here? What are the perspectives around each issue? And how do we grapple with this so that we move more towards a disrupting inequalities in our communities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, Looking at the two experiences that we've had and thinking about the, the definition of transformative resistance, how have communities of color, and we looked at two, the Hmong community and the Latino community, how have they grappled with identity and positionality to address complex issues and processes to disrupt inequalities? So here we have a picture of a Hmong farmer, but we also have a picture of the very first Hmong mayor in California, and I want to say maybe even the United States, but to see that there are various aspects of that spectrum and that uh -huh. continuum uh -huh. of where immigrants and refugees land. Uh -huh. But it's the opportunity and it's the, it's the collaborative cultural connections that they find once they come here that help them to... Right. To, right. On the to, shoulders of others. On the shoulders of others, but also trailblazing in a sense. Trailblazing. How their communities are seen. They are in control of their identity. 
seeing these two different aspects of the continuum just shows that. And the other example, my favorite, because I'm a Latina, is my grandfather was a migrant farm worker mm -hmm. for um, different months in the year during the Depression. And he said it was the most happiest time of his life. Really? Because he got on the earth and it, it, he made his connection and he was growing something he felt productive. Mm. But then we see the story of Jose Hernandez, the yes. first Latino astronaut, right? And there was just a movie about him, about something about the stars, and told his story and how he was a migrant farmer in the Central Valley, and he saw the uh, 1969 landing of the moon, and he said, I'm going to do that. Right. Those are great stories. Great stories. And powerful when you hear that, especially if you're from that same, that same group. Right? Right. Tani Cantil Sakayue was the first Filipina appointed to be the California Chief Justice. That's a great story. You know, anyone who's been, and I, well, in my family, I was the first to go to college. Mm -hmm. That was a Me too. big deal. Right? That was a big deal for our families. Yes. Maybe not to others, but boy, there were a lot of tears at those graduations. <laughs> and I can only imagine an entire communities right. with tears seeing these people just accomplish such great things and being part of the political, economic, social mainstream of our country as contributors. Right, and it's it's not only about, you know, the usual four or five that you hear about at, you know, Hispanic yes. American Month or African American Month, but it's also about people like Jose, who started yes. as a migrant farm worker, yes. right? And it's, and it's not only I can identify with him because I'm a Latina, but I can identify with him because I'm a human being who wants to just live and thrive mm -hmm. and be a part of this really open, diverse, robust, creative, wonderful democratic society that can be. And I think these are examples of how that comes to fruition. Mm -hmm. I love these stories. And I just love how the term resistance is kind of reframed. So it's not fighting the system, but working with it to find those pathways to make a place, to take a stand, to be contributors. There's probably dozens, if not hundreds, of these stories. And this is, I want to go back to the importance of these oral histories in families. You know, when you think about what grandparents, parents and grandparents struggled with, anyone who's from an immigrant family, or particularly African Americans who have a heritage of slavery, when you think back, that's why history education is so important. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know where you are if you don't know where you've been and where you've come from. And so framing it in this way as a form of resistance is such a powerful message because that's where we want kids to come away from. We hear so many times African-American families just discouraged because the only time they show up in the textbooks is as slaves. Or you'll see Jewish families say, the only time we show up is during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Lambs led to the slaughter. The stories of active resistance, but also these kinds of stories where people are building and moving and being empowering and as models for the, the whole next generation right. is great. And I think the transformative part of it is that they're transforming the way we look at them. They're saying, I'm not just a farm worker. That is hard work not taken mm -hmm. away from farm workers. Otherwise, we wouldn't have mm -hmm. food. But don't limit me to that. Exactly. Right. And we're seeing this with other communities, LGBTQ+. Plus, Absolutely. Who have um, discriminated, pushed down, made to be feel invisible. Now, coming out, taking positions, demonstrating the same kind of resistance, people with abilities and disabilities. Right. I mean, it goes on and on, right? Women. We could talk a lot about women, mm -hmm. how they have felt suppressed, discriminated. More stories of resistance. So thank you for bringing that into the light for us, Barb. All right? Thank you. So Critical Hope is in part three. Tell us a little more about that. Critical Hope looks at how transformative resistance, how identity and positionality is restructured mm -hmm. so that we're not seeing just the, the single story. But then, okay, now what? So you take that into the community. What does justice look like, mm. right? So how have communities of color articulated justice? Because sometimes justice to one group is mm. compliance mm. Mm -hmm. to another group. Mm. Or injustice to or another injustice. group. Or injustice, yes. Exactly. exactly. All right, we're looking forward to that. Great. Thank you, Barb. Mm -hmm.